Save it for the radio. Okay. Uh, just in the spirit of uh, feature films, we thought we'd start with a short. And this was a short film that I did back at school, back before there were a lot of computers. So it's hand-drawn, bear with us. Um, and it was inspired by Minnesota, which is why I thought I'd bring it. So. Good evening and welcome to a special collaboration between the Minneapolis ID Exchange Mix and the Westminster Town Hall Forum. I'm Kathy Worzer. I'm the host of Morning Edition on Minnesota Public Radio News and guest moderator of tonight's forum. This event is being broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church located on the Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Pete Docter is a film director, animator, and screenwriter at Pixar Animation Studios. He contributed to the story and characters of Toy Story, Pixar's first full-length animated feature film, and served as the supervising animator for that film. He wrote story treatments for Toy Story 2 and Wall-E, and directed Monsters, Inc., Up, and his latest release, Inside Out. He's been nominated for six Academy Awards, and won Best Animated Feature Film for Up. Born and raised in Bloomington, Minnesota, he graduated from the California Institute of the Arts, where he received a Student Academy Award. In 1990, on the day following his graduation, he began work at Pixar Studios as its third animator. Time has shown the great wisdom of their choice. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum and back home, Pete Doctor. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I got some slides to show you, but of course we can't see that on the radio, so I'm going to speak enigmatically about them so that the home audience doesn't feel as though they're missing anything. Um, and really, it's photos like this of my home growing up. I grew up just a little a while, a ways away from here in Bloomington. So nice there in May, you know. Um, <laughs> I was a happy kid. I had a good fashion sense, as you can see. Uh, and for as long as I can remember, I've always loved making things. Now, uh, the arts are full of people who have had to fight against their parents who forbid them from following their passion on the road to becoming artists. But my parents were encouraging and supportive. <laughs> so, so where did that leave me? I had no one to fight against, so I had to develop a healthy sense of self-doubt and insecurity, which, is, uh, which I nurse to this day. Um, actually, this sort of started in junior high for me. Up until then, everything was pretty upfront, but in junior high, things started getting confusing. You know, suddenly I 
was aware of wearing the wrong thing and what was cool and what wasn't. I had no real idea for that. So I was most happy alone in my room fiddling with electronics or making and watching cartoons. I love cartoons. I actually don't remember what the first cartoon was that got me hooked, maybe Pinocchio or Fantasia, but whatever it was, I was absolutely amazed. And though I love the drawings, what really hooked me was the fact that they move, right? And, and I knew that they were just drawings up there, but it just seemed so believable to me that it was almost like magic or something. And when I discovered I could do this, when I made a flip book on the corner of my math, my math book, I was hooked. <laughs> and I've since then made a whole bucket full of flip books on th uh, 3M notebook, notepads, which I think my mom still has in the closet. Um, and I still make them. This is one that I made uh, a couple years ago uh, instead of family Christmas cards. And um, it's, you know, the basic idea is that... <laughs> you can't see the, the end card says, the joyous sounds of Christmas. So, um, but from an early age, I knew this was what I wanted to do. This was what I wanted to know more about. Now, as a kid, I believed two things. Number one, the people who made these cartoons were unapproachably brilliant group of super geniuses. And two, that the stories they created must have formed fully and sprung forth from their brain like jewels, you know. I imagined uh, Walt Disney lying in bed and just sitting up and going, Dumbo, and the whole thing <laughs> would be there. Well, as it turns out, neither of the, these are true. Um, I, I left the blissful refuge of Bloomington to attend college at the California Institute of the Arts in Valencia, California, which was, at the time, uh, one of the few places that had a major in animation. And when I graduated, I was born at a good time, which I credit my parents for. Uh, <laughs> it was a time when animation was just blooming, and so The Simpsons was just starting up, Disney was hiring, uh, and therefore it made no sense at all that I started at a small computer company called Pixar. Now you have to remember this was a time before Pixar was a, a name that people knew. In fact, if you had heard of it, uh, it was probably because of the Pixar image computer, which was their primary business. Um, actually, I'm not even sure you could call it primary business because they were losing a million dollars a month making these things. And in fact, the first time I met Steve Jobs, the owner, was when he came to lay off half the company. And I thought, oh, okay, did I really make the right choice coming to this studio? I don't know. Uh, but within a few years, we started working on a feature. Um, Joe Ramft, myself, John Lasseter, and Andrew Stanton started to write and draw what would become Toy Story. And believe it or not, when we started on this film, we were sort of upset. We were really angry because there was an unwritten rule that if there was, if, 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 sorry, if it was animated, it had to be a musical. Uh, this is the early 90s, and now I'm not against musicals, I love musicals, but we knew that animation was capable of so much more than this, and we really wanted to push things, and we swore to each other that we would do something new. Um, in fact, when we first pitched this to Disney, they said, great, we love the story, where do the songs go? And we said, no, we're not gonna, it's gonna be a no music, we're gonna try a buddy film structure, which had never been done before, no cute animal sidekicks, etc." And so we really tried to push things, and we've tried to do that in every film since then. Um, when the film came out, it was a huge success, which surprised the heck out of me, because I, you know, it felt like just a bunch of guys making these things for fun. But what was one of the greatest things for me, the side benefit of this, was that I got to meet some of my heroes, like Chuck Jones, who, of course, uh, directed a lot of the Bugs Bunny cartoons, and Roadrunner, and so on. Uh, I got to meet Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson, two of Disney's nine old men, and speak and really uh, get to know quite well Joe Grant, who co-wrote Dumbo and picked the music for Fantasia. This was, ah, uh, I couldn't believe how fortunate I was. At any rate, the success of Toy Story meant that we were gonna need more movies. So I asked uh, John Lasseter if I could develop one, and he said yes. So uh, one thing that surprised me actually when Toy Story came out, a lot of people came up to me and said, you know, I sort of secretly thought my toys came to life too uh, when I wasn't around. And I thought, I wonder if there's anything else like that that we all know is true. And I knew that there were monsters that were hiding in my closet waiting to scare me at night. <laughs> So what if we explored that world? And we started messing around and we tried to explain why sometimes the monsters in your closet might look like an item of clothing. Uh, we thought about pairing monsters with specific fears like the fear of heights. Uh, but most exciting of all, we came up with this idea 
that monsters scare kids for a living. That's their job, right? <laughs> These guys work at this giant factory. They clock in, they clock out. They belong to a union. And uh, <laughs> I was feeling really good about this concept. Uh, when I pitched it, people laughed. We had a clever idea, and I was feeling good. And yet, as I fleshed out the story, somehow it just didn't work. The audience was bored. Uh, people told me, you know, I don't get what this movie is about. I was like, what do you mean you don't get what it's about? It's a monster scaring kids. What is there to get? I had this really clever idea, I thought, and yet somehow the movie was failing. And this was very stressful for me because I love this job. You know, I, animating on Toy Story, I'd work late into the night. My wife Amanda would wait for me. She'd play solitaire on one of the other computers. And about two in the morning, I'd wake her up and we would walk to our house, which is only two, three blocks away, so I could be sure to be there first thing the next morning at nine o'clock. And then what happened was, around then, my wife and I had a kid. And this was an amazing experience, and of course, you guys know, it changed everything. Your brain just kind of explodes. Uh, and I was still having a great time at work, but now I wanted to be at home and watch this amazing creature. And so I was, work or home, how do I, I want to be in both places, how do I do this? The answer is, of course, there is no answer. And that conflict became the deeper story of what Monsters, Inc. is really about. It's not a monster who, loves to, who scares kids. It's a guy who loves his job and comes to care for a kid. So to me, that was a real lesson, that these stories are uh, most interesting to people when they're about real, unsolvable life is issues. Luckily, the film was a success, and they said, all right, you can do another one. So, um, this time I wanted to do something really new and push something that, you know, do something nobody had ever seen before. And I had this idea about a floating city. There were these two princes, these brothers, who lived on it, and they got in a fight and they fell off this floating city, and then to get back they had to follow this aboriginal bird creature. You remember this one? <laughs> Probably not. Uh, actually, it became up. So the design work was really awesome, and this whole story was to me, clicking along in an interesting way, but it really just didn't land with people. Um, I remember one, one of the guys, Lee Unkrit, said, you know, I really have trouble relating to princes who get everything they want. <laughs> so I, I went back to the desk and I was like, okay, this is not gonna go. What is it that keeps drawing me this, to this story? Why do I like it? One of the things that no, nobody told me when I was directing Monsters was that as a director, you don't actually do anything. All you do is talk to people. And so, growing up as an introvert, the idea of talking to people, by the end of the day, I would just crawl into my desk and kind of rock to myself. Uh, I found myself seriously draw, uh, doodling a lot about being st uh, stranded on a, a tropical island. I look back, I, I had all these books about traveling to the South Pole and the jungles of South America. And so I was really uh, drawn to this idea of escape and this idea that sometimes the world just gets too much. And so I went back to the floating city and we replaced it with a single house. And those princes became a lone man. And at, at its heart, the feeling of getting away from it all, which I think everybody can really relate to, that sometimes the world's just too much, that what really became the central driver for this story. Um, of course, I'd always thought it would be fun to do something with a grouchy old man character, somebody who is kind of a jerk but could get away with it. Um, and you'd still like them. So I did a bunch of drawings about things I had observed in real life. Um, you know, details about like not eating spicy food, walking around with your mouth open, things old people do, which sadly, <laughs> sadly as I get older, I'm starting to do all these things now. Uh, so this might be as good a time as any to just talk a little bit about our process, how we make our films. Um, of course, it all starts with an idea. And as we develop that idea, we move into what we call story development, which is basically a lot of talking, uh, research, kicking it around, talking to each other, and sometimes that's really as far as they go. They just end there. But if an idea still has promise, we move on to the writing phase, which for us means treatment, script, and then thousands of drawings, storyboards, which even though they're drawings, to us is still writing. It's an exten extension of the script process. Uh, meanwhile, at the same time, we have a, an amazing group, the art department, is figuring out what all this stuff is going to look like. They do this by creating thousands of drawings and plans, and then they give those plans to the technical department, and they build those characters, sets, and props, uh, and pass along all that stuff to the layout department. 
Now the layout department is kind of like our camera group. They set up everything, they set up the camera, they think in terms of wide shots, masters, overs, all of this kind of thing, and we assemble all this together into a cut. So it's basically edited before we shoot it, if it makes sense. We know exactly what those shots are gonna be before we give them to animation. Now animation is the equivalent of our actors. They create the movement, the expression, the gestures, Anything that's too complicated to do by hand, say, for example, thousands of balloons tied to a house, that is handled by the simulation group. So um, that gets folded into the mix. And then, of course, you have effects like fire, rain, water, explosions, even glitter explosions. Um, so that's the effects group. And then uh, it goes to lighting, which takes the flat, plain colors that, you, that we see as we're making this thing and gives them shape and shadows, um, and so it starts to really look pretty spectacular. Um, then after a number of checkpoints to make sure everything is behaving the way we thought it would, we do the final render, which brings everything together, the model, the movement, the, the lighting, and each second that you see on screen requires about 20, well, exactly, 24 frames. Each one of those frames can be up to several days worth of render time, so it's really a slow process made one frame at a time. All the stuff that I talked about at first, the planning, writing, drawing, the figuring out what we're going to do, that is what we call pre-production. And then the later stuff, the actual making, like building, moving, painting, lighting, that's all production. But it all starts with that idea, and um, I'm now going back, finishing on up, I started again, wanting to find something that everyone was familiar with. Um, but this, as I know now, is a fine line. If it's too familiar, you feel like, oh, I've seen that before. Uh, it's boring. But if it's too different, like the floating city thing, uh, people say, what is this? I don't relate to this. I have no idea. So really where these ideas come from, I have no idea, or I go there more often. But I got this idea about emotions as characters. And I'd seen books and movies and things that take you inside the body, but I'd never seen emotions brought to life as characters, and that seemed really intriguing to me. I felt like, boy, if we do this right, this could be like our version of the Seven Dwarfs, you know, strong characters that you would know instantly what they're all about. And yet I also knew that wasn't enough. So I started thinking, what is this going to be about? I talked to friends at work, Ronnie Del Carmen, who's a co-director, and Jonas Rivera, our producer. And as it turned out, about this time, my daughter, Ellie, was about nine when she did the voice of young Ellie in Up. So if you've seen that film, that character uh, was actually a lot like her. <laughs> she was always full of goofiness and pep and energy um, until she turned 11. <laughs> and suddenly we had a lot more moments of quiet and drama. And I just thought, I wonder what's going on inside her head. Because I remember that happened to me too as I talked about. That's a difficult time growing up. And so we thought, what if we took this idea of it examining what it is to grow up uh, as personified through emotions as characters? So with that basic pitch, um, this is uh, the pitch that I gave to John Lasseter that I just gave you, um, I, I went to tell him about it. And John's office um, <laughs> is basically a toy heaven. He has every single toy made from, from all the Pixar films. This is only a small portion of them in his office, but it was too distracting in there. So we went to this boring white room, <laughs> and I pitched John the idea of this. We have a little girl, but she's actually the setting, because inside her head are her emotions. And he agreed that basic premise really sounded interesting, and so we were on to the development phase. And as I mentioned, we do a lot of talking and drawing on whiteboards to get a basic sense of how this thing is going to look. But around this time, we started realizing how little we knew about this subject. So um, we, one choice that I made early on was this was going to be set in the mind, not the brain. So no blood vessels and dendrites and stuff. We were talking about consciousness, memory, personality attributes and things, which was really freeing because that meant we get to make everything up. But it was difficult because we didn't know what it was supposed to look like. You couldn't look at a picture of a fish or a car and go, OK, make it like that. So we turned to science for concrete answers to our problems. Well, we should have known better because uh, depending on which scientist you talk to, you get very different answers. Even things like, how many emotions are there? Well, one guy I asked, he said, well, there are four basic emotions. The next guy said 27. Uh, so, you know, it was very, uh, it's, it's not agreed upon by science. But we were fortunate to live in the same town as one of the pioneering scientists in the study of emotions, Dr. Paul Ekman. 
Um, and he had this basic theory that there are six emotions, that being happiness, surprise, fear, sadness, anger, and disgust. As I was kind of doodling, I thought, well, surprise and fear both seem like they would react kind of similarly as a, as a character, so let's just get rid of that. And that's how we ended up with the five that we have. Of course, uh, we then uh, learned that this was his early work, that in his later work, he's posited 16 emotions. <laughs> but it was too late. So uh, the real key benefit of this research, not only identifying which emotions there were, uh, was that each emotion has a job. And I never thought of it like that, but, but it's true. And some of them are more obvious. Fear, for example, keeps you from taking unnecessary risk, keeps you safe. And so its trigger is uncertainty. Of course, in the film, we were able to get Bill Hader, who's fantastic. We, we found this picture online, by the way. We didn't take it. For the thing. So um, anger is interesting. Uh, I, I used to think of it as just getting you into fights things you'd regret saying later and so on. Well, it turns out anger keeps you from getting a raw deal, makes sure that things are fair, which makes a lot of sense because uh, social justice and, uh, and fairness have a lot to do with the uh, work that uh, Lewis Black uses his, in his stand-up comedy. So, um, in fact, this was interesting. Um, Paul Ekman, he, he, he says a lot of times anger gets a raw deal. If you think about social justice, you know, helping people around the world, Oftentimes, that's triggered by you watching something in the news and going, that's not right, and feeling this indignation. So anger can be a very useful emotion, just like all these. Uh, disgust, basically a response that keeps you from getting poisoned. In fact, that expression that you make, eh, uh, this was in an early uh, work by Charles Darwin. He said, that's probably a result from an adaptation from spitting out food. So if you feed like bitter food to babies, they go, and they spit it out. And that face then is the same face we make even in social situations. If we see someone wearing a, you know, awful tie or something, yeah, you know. So <laughs> she, of course, is triggered by purity. And we were lucky to get Mindy Kaling from the Mindy product. <laughs> um, our producer, Jonas, had to call Mindy and say, hey, we'd love you to be in a Pixar movie. Uh, the character's disgust. <laughs> uh, and she said, what? And he said, oh, no, she's disgusted, not disgusting. So. She said, oh, okay, so she was okay with that. Um, sadness is a lot less obvious. In fact, I think for a lot of us, because we feel that sadness is a negative thing, we try to avoid it or even self-medicate. Um, it's not immediately obvious why you'd want sadness in your life, which we used to our advantage in the film. Um, of course, in real life, sadness is triggered by loss, and it helps, helps you deal with loss. And um, we uh, cast uh, Phyllis Smith from the U.S. version of The Office, for this role, who is just fantastic. Of course, there's a reason why our kid in the film is always happy, and that's because her lead emotion is joy, uh, and joy is our response to benefit or gain, and of course, she's voiced by the incredible, funny Amy Poehler. So you can see all these, these different emotions uh, have different jobs, and that's why I was so excited about this idea, because they're all strong, opinionated, caricatured. This is exactly what animation does well. So, this is about where we start the writing process. And, and um, of course, all this character development, the, 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 uh, the characters, we don't know quite what they're gonna look like at this time. But um, most people think of writing as script writing, and that's true for us, but for us, we also draw. So drawing for us is a, an extension of the, the script writing process. And we have this amazing team of artists, and what they do is not only draw individual drawings, but they put them together in sequence. And that way you can flip through these drawings to conven convey uh, how the scene will unfold. You get a pretty good sense of it. We did about 177,000 drawings for Inside Out. Um, and it's not just one version of it. I'll explain that in a second. Once I uh, approve these uh, storyboards, they go to editorial. And our editor, Kevin Nolting, cuts the boards together with dialogue, music, and sound effects, and stuff that we create ourselves. And um, when it all comes together, it gives you a basic sense of uh, what the film will be like, and we call this a story reel. Now, our first attempt usually doesn't quite work. So we start thinking and talking and drawing and rewriting and recutting, and we try it again. And usually the second try is a little closer, but still not quite it. So each sequence takes about three to five working sessions. 
Um, each session is about three to four hours, and that's not counting all the work, of course, that builds up to that. For any given film, we have approximately 27 sequences, so if you do the math, that comes to a lot. I don't know, I went to art school. Um, <laughs> but we cut all this together and we bring it into our main theater and we run the film for everybody. Besides our crew or the kitchen staff or whoever we can get in there, we also have John Lasseter, Lee Unkrich, Andrew Stanton, the other filmmakers who are making their own prog projects. And after the screening, we meet up here in this room, this conference room, where we share opinions about what worked and what did. Now, Truth is, a lot of these ideas are really great, and some of them are not so great, uh, and it's basically understood that it's up to the filmmaking team to figure out which are which. So there's no mandatory notes. It's all just ideas, things to throw on the pile, uh, and, and it's up to us to figure out which ones to use. Now uh, we'll go back and do this whole process again. We take those notes, we go back, and we start drawing again, and again, and again. We do this about seven or eight times on every film. So for the film that you see in the theater, there's at least eight versions of that that hopefully you'll never see because they're awful. Well, unfortunately, I don't have time to get into the production end of things. There's a whole other talk about the design of the props and sets, uh, recording the actors like Amy Poehler and Phyllis Smith, Bill Hader, uh, of course, camera work, animation, lighting, all the production stuff. But, you know, making these films takes a while, from concept through treatment and script and multiple versions of these various things, of course, through storyboarding, cutting it all together with dialogue, music, and sound effects, um, screening the film, talking about what could be better, doing that again and again and again. This whole process, uh, before we start to get things approved for production so that we can actually make the thing, in total, the whole thing from beginning to end is about five years. Now, after hearing this, you might well ask yourself, why? <laughs> why do you do, do all that? Why don't you just get it right the first time? <laughs> well, the problem is we know we're going to be wrong. And if we don't allow ourselves to be wrong, we're never going to do anything new. We're just going to rely on things that we know work. So for us, making mistakes is an essential part of our process. We're not embarrassed by it. In fact, we plan for it. But the bigger question is why even make films at all? As I just told you, it's a heck of a lot of work. I spent five years working on Inside Out, took hundreds of people, working thousands of hours. Why do we spend our lives making movies in the first place? Well, at their best, movies are an art form. And to me, all art is storytelling. It's about talking to someone, telling them how you feel about something that happened to you. I believe that art is as essential to our existence as breathing and eating. The world out there is sometimes a big and lonely place, and it's very easy to feel like we're all alone. So we tell stories to each other. We talk about how it feels to love and have our hearts broken, how it feels when our kids grow up and go out into the big wide world. We talk about our mistakes, our triumphs, the experiences of our life. And when we tell each other about that, about what it feels like to be alive, it's in these moments that we come to realize that maybe we aren't so alone after all. That's why I make movies anyway, and I hope it shows up in my work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pete Doctor. You are listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on the Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. I'm Kathy Worzer, the guest moderator of tonight's forum. Our speaker is Pete Doctor, animator and director at Pixar Animation Studios, whose recently released film, Inside Out, has received wide acclaim. Now, while the ushers are going to collect questions from the in-house audience right now, I'd like to invite the radio audience to join us Thursday evening, October the 1st, 7 p.m., when Tavis Smiley will speak on the topic, No One Left Out, Creating Communities of Justice. 
Information can be found online at westminsterforum.org or minneapolisideaexchange.com. Again, westminsterforum.org or minneapolisideaexchange.com. Pete, if you'd like to come up to the podium here, the pulpit, I'll present some questions from the audience. We, I bet we have some good ones. We always do here at Westminster Town Hall Forum. Um, there was, you had a quote a while back. You can have Academy Awards sitting in your office but you still feel like that was probably just a fluke. That was probably the right combination of things that happened. Can I do that again? I have no idea. Do you worry about the creative well going dry? That has to be a lot of pressure. How do you, how do you overcome that? I don't necessarily worry about it going dry. I worry about it never having existed in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> that somehow you know, I was relying on the right people and the weird magic stuff happened and that I'm not actually very talented. Uh, that, that that's, that's, I think everybody kind of has those worries at, at, at moments, at the very least, so, yeah. <laughs> Good questions here. What picks our characters most Pete Doctor-esque? What picks our characters most Pete uh, Doctor-esque? Uh, mm. I don't know, probably Kevin the bird from Up. <laughs> In fact, I actually did the voice of that character, if you, if you, you want me to do it now? And speaking of voicing characters, many animated characters resemble their voice actors. When you create a new character, do you have a specific actor in mind, or do you modify the animation once the voice is cast? Uh, we usually have the characters fully designed and built and even articulated, that is, they are able to move inside the computer before we think about casting. Um, but once we do cast, we record before the animation is done and we're able to then uh, watch and listen to those actors so that we can borrow little nuances or expressions and gestures. And I think this is what people mean when they, well, you know, a lot of people will say, boy, Billy Crystal looks just like Mike Wazowski. And I think, I don't think Billy Crystal would like to hear that. Uh, but that's probably what they mean because we were able to do the little, like, he sort of talks out of the side of his mouth and we borrow the little kind of opening on one side more and so on. So that's all a great observation on behalf on the part of the animators that, that I work with. Do the actors and the actresses kind of get into the process? Yeah, they do. They, they love, I mean, the nice thing about working in animation is you don't have to do c costume and makeup. You just roll out of bed, and it doesn't mean it's not a lot of work. They sweat. We make them really work. Um, but they, they really contribute a ton. I mean, in this film, everybody, but especially um, we worked with Bill Hader and uh, um, Amy Poehler as writers. So we would just sit and workshop ideas and, and they really get into it and that's what makes it fun. This is from a student. What makes a compelling character? Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, there are all those uh, books that you read that talk about like self-contradiction and um, uh, nuance and multifaceted, you know, so that just when you think you know them, you surprise the, the audience by bringing something else. But I think the truthful answer is, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know where these characters come from. I've seen them created from nothing to, to finished, and I don't, it just feels like they have already existed somewhere out there in the world, and we somehow captured the right little pieces of it and put it on film. I know that sounds very sort of artsy-fartsy, but uh, yeah, that's, it's a mysterious process, I'll say that. This is another student. Good question. How do you deal with creative disputes during a film's production, especially when all sides are equally passionate about their ideas? Mud fights. Excellent. Get in there. No. Um, I bet you could take somebody down. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we, we just continue to argue. Uh, it's, uh, Steve Jobs had this great uh, uh, saying. He said, if someone disagrees with, with me, I just continue to tell them why I'm right. I think I'm butchering that quote, but it's essentially we try to convince uh, each other as desperately as we can. Um, and that as sometimes adds to uh, spirited discussions, shall we say, um, but I think that's good. You know, not, uh, not everybody gets along all the time. As long as it's, the disagreement is about the work, I think it's, it's good to have some fights and, and uh, butt heads a little bit. So um, in the end, what's right is the audience. 
So I might feel passionately about some idea or joke or turn in the story, and then you put it up on the screen, and if it doesn't land, you're like, well, all right, that didn't work, and go back and figure out what would. I like listening to you talk about the process, the creative process, and what goes into making a film. Uh, audience member wants to know, can you talk about what the work environment is like at Pixar? It looks like it would be fun. It is. It's a great place to work, and I credit you know, a lot of people. John Lasseter has this incredible sense of play uh, in everything, and he's really brought that spirit to the whole place. Um, it's a place you'll see people riding scooters and you know, wearing ridiculous clothing and making costumes, decorating their offices. Uh, we spend a lot of time kind of goofing around. Well, actually, that's not true. We spend a lot of energy goofing around, but not a lot of time because a lot of it is devoted to work. We work really hard. So uh, that is actually absolutely true. <laughs> Somebody's laughing in the I, eye. I, so. I know. <laughs> no, it really is. I mean, the animators, uh, and we've gotten better at this, but we, on Toy Story 2, people worked so many hours that they've developed serious cases of RSI. People were out for years. Um, we have Producers who usually you kind of think producer's job is to say come on work a little harder the producers at Pixar have to say go home Stop animating, you know because people care so passionately about what we do um, That people really do work uh, very very long hours Inside out being the obvious example. How did growing up in the Midwest shape the stories you tell? Hmm, I think uh, you know, we're all sort of these bowls of soup made of all the ingredients that have been thrown in, and uh, I, oftentimes I'm not even fully aware of, of what went into that soup uh, to make who I am. But um, I think there's a sense of community here that obviously uh, I feel like the, the, hopefully informs the stories that I tell and the characters. Um, sense of humor. I know some people don't believe that Minnesotans actually have a sense of humor, but... <laughs> I think all of that went into the work, and, and probably it's for somebody else to say exactly what, <laughs> rather than me. Simple question. What's your favorite movie? Ooh. Uh, that's a, not a simple question, actually. That's, uh, I mean, depending on the day and depending on what we're talking about, I'll, I'll be able to list off, you know, 50 or so. I mean, uh, there's... Wizard of Oz, uh, I mean, Dumbo is fantastic, uh, uh, Paper Moon, you better cut me off, I'll just keep going. You know, I talked about Paper Moon yeah. backstage, why did you like that movie so much? Uh, are you familiar with that film, the Bogdanovich film, it's fantastic, hey, all right, there's Mr. Bogdanovich up there. <laughs> um, no, it's a fantastic film with a very uh, wonderful relationship, and I think to me, if you really strip down why you like a film, what compels you to keep watching? I'd say like 99% of the time it's relationship. It's watching a character grow and change and what changes people in real life, other people. So um, that film in particular, I think just is, is so well done and crafted uh, so brilliantly, those characters bump, bumping and rubbing up against each other. It's just fun to watch. Your parents are enthralled with you tonight. Was that always the case? Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, as I mentioned, my parents, I think, have been incredibly supportive, not of me alone, but, and not, I have two sisters who are also in the arts, they're both musicians, but my parents are both teachers, and I think they've encouraged uh, a wide net, hundreds and thousands of people, uh, and uh, I'm very thankful for them, so. Yeah. Another question about growing up. This is from a student. Who was your favorite animated character when you were growing up, and has it changed? Hmm. I probably, uh, to me, like the high point of the week was watching the Bugs Bunny Roadrunner Hour, which was on Saturdays at nine o'clock. Oh, well, that, that shifted to 8.30 at one point. So, you know, you had to really watch out um, so you don't miss any. But Bugs Bunny was always a character that I sort of secretly wished I could be because he can get away with anything and say things to people and stuff, but um, uh, plus he was just fun to watch. He was well animated, so that, I, that's a character that I definitely like. But, you know, again, it's kind of like the question about your favorite film. Depending on the day and the situation, I might answer differently. Yeah. It's a tough question. Where do you go for inspiration? 
I try to keep a sketchbook. I'm not as good as, it, as some of the other guys at work, but you know, sitting at the airport, instead of taking my iPhone out, which definitely I'm guilty of, just ask my wife, I'm addicted to this stupid thing, but I try to grab my sketchbook and watch people because you never know where little nuances or ideas are gonna come from, the way somebody uh, holds their fork or a particular walk or whatever, things people do. Um, I also, uh, I like to go for walks myself, just by myself and think, um, get my heart rate going, so that's one thought. Another thing that we do if you're stuck for ideas, this is kind of a trick, is to just start making a list. Because a lot of times what's holding you back is self-censorship. You think, ah, oh, that's stupid. So if it's stupid or whatever, write it down and then just keep going. And if you force yourself to just keep going by number 14 or 37, you hey, wait a minute, that's actually pretty good. So that's, that's another trick we use. This is from a little animator. Hi, Pete. Hi. What's your favorite emotion or sensation to convey in animation? Mm. Um, most of my own animation is about jumping and because that's really fun to animate people, characters moving around a lot. So I'd say joy for sure uh, is the most fun from a movement standpoint. Uh, in the film, fear was also, I didn't actually get to animate any of the characters on this film. Like I say, directors don't actually do anything. Um, <laughs> but, but fear was a lot of fun to watch the animators because he was so wild and, and would zip around. Uh, he was, that was a great character as well. I've worked with directors and producers in my past. Can you give us an idea of what those pitch meetings are like? Because it can be pretty tough in there. Pitching this, the story, you mean? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you really have to be kind of part salesman and think about how, how is the audience going to react to this? What in particular are, are they going to react to? And how do I convey it in a way that makes them interested and lean forward? I mean, that's, that's really the key. But, you know, sometimes audiences are tough. And, uh, and the nice thing, at the end of the day, I know that at Pixar, even if the audience is sitting there kind of, you know, not looking very happy, they, they are there to help me. And I think that's something that just takes a little while for people to recognize that, that the only way this sort of thing works is when you really trust your collaborators. You have to have this sense of trust uh, with each other. Did any of your movies have a different ending that you wish stayed or one that you would like to have changed? Hmm. Well, I will say, this is not quite the answer to the question, but when we, we had a preview, preview screening, I should back up, um, by the time we're like, uh, usually between half and 75% finished in animation, we often have a, an audience preview screening. So we'll, f we'll go to some mystery theater, we'll grab people off the street, who uh, they, they have to be willing, uh, we don't just <laughs> grab them. And we show them the film, and um, they have no idea what they're gonna see, um, in this case, it was Monsters, Inc. So the audience watched it, and the ending was not animated. It was just drawings, it was just storyboards. And um, someone, I think, in the audience preview screening, uh, they have like a question and answer thing afterwards, said, I wanna see what happens to Sully and Boo when Sully goes to see Boo again. And then the guy says, how many people wanna see that? And everybody raises their hand, and all the executives turn to me and say, you gotta show them what happens to Boo next. <laughs> And I was, I was thinking, this is gonna be a disaster because I don't, there's no way I can do something that'll be as good as what's in their heads. And so I really stuck to that. Um, and that was one where, you know, we had to fight a little bit, but in the end, I think it was the right choice. So sometimes, you know, stuff like that happens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this question's asked by the Greater Twin Cities Youth Symphonies uh, in the audience. The whole symphony is there? I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> How did your musical upbringing impact the creative process of your animation career? Hmm. Music is, is a lot like animation in that it's time-based. So I think the fact that I uh, was exposed to music and played music from an early age, it really influenced my sense of timing. So as an animator, I would sketch things out and then I would hear it in my head. I'd hear the characters like, you know, falling down the stairs. Dun, 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 dun. And I would kind of time it with a stopwatch based on the music that I hear in my head. So in that sense, uh, it was a pretty big influence. Um, uh, I think, uh, too, just from a storytelling standpoint, the idea of music 
being so much a part of the film, the process of making films, um, I like to think anyway that I have an ear for music that'll work and really uh, reinforce the storytelling uh, as well. So I didn't like practicing though, <laughs> I will make that clear. <laughs> But it was a good thing. All right, I said it. <laughs> Several questions here from young filmmakers and young, young animators. What advice do you have for an aspiring young filmmaker or an aspiring young animator? Do it. There is nothing holding you back. I mean, when, uh, when it used to be, you'd shoot, when I was a kid, you'd shoot on Super 8 film and you had to have enough money for that and then you'd take it to the... Uh, get it developed and wait a couple days. Now you have your iPhone. You could, you could literally make a movie with this thing. Um, you can, using your computer, you can do stuff. A lot of times people th come to me and say, I'm thinking about getting into animation. I'm like, well, do it. You would never expect a kid to pick up a violin and play at Carnegie Hall that, that night, right? Filmmaking is the same way. It takes a lot of practice. There are gonna be a lot of mistakes and you just have to do a lot of it before you're gonna get really good. Um, I know growing up, I, I, like I said, I felt like there were these people who were just born unfairly talented. Um, and that's true, but <laughs> even they had to work really hard. Uh, it takes a lot of work and a lot of practice. Your parents were your first teachers, but did any of your other teachers have a particularly strong influence on you? Yeah, I had a lot of teachers. Um, who really encouraged me in various ways. Uh, Mrs. Kennedy, who is my fourth grade teacher, is she here? There she is, hey! <laughs> yeah, I, think, I think you'd seen that I was drawing a lot of Peanuts cartoons, basically copying them, right? Panel by panel, because I liked Peanuts. And she said, why don't you try doing some of your own? You know, and so just little things that people, you might not even remember uh, later, but it doesn't take a lot sometimes to encourage somebody and just push them in the right way. Um, I had a great teacher. I was lucky in high school to be part of this uh, outreach program that kind of placed students in different places. I worked at this company called Bages Jones. And again, okay, so this company was in Edina. I think they're out of business now. They made commercials and uh, out of the goodness of their hearts, who knows why, they said, yeah, sure, kid, come on in here, use any of the equipment you want, and bother any of these guys who are supposed to be doing their work. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, at, somehow that worked for them, and, and it was an incredibly encouraging thing for me. Uh, I learned a ton from those guys. So there's just so many, you know, anybody who could ever stand up and say, hey, I'm a self-made man, I think they're full of baloney, because everybody has, uh, you know, shoulders to stand on, and I have a lot. You and I were talking about writing off stage too. Yes. Who really taught you how to write? Yeah, a lot of, I mean, Miss Swisher, Miss Clarence Swisher, who was our 12th grade writing teacher, is a bunch of guys that I went to high school with uh, who are nodding now. She was, <laughs> she was tough. She was tough because she would, she would really, there was a lot of red on the paper, you know. Uh, <laughs> but she was telling, tell, telling us stuff over and over and over, and I look back and I go, how thick-headed was I that I didn't understand what she was saying, but uh, I didn't, and it just took a while, so. Well, you weren't ready for it at that yes. point. Yeah. yeah. She's in the audience. Is she, she in the audience? audience? There she there is. There she is. Oh my God. Thank goodness I'm you said of, something nice about her. I'm kind That's of scared. That's good. I'm kind of scared now. <laughs> Since this is an ideas forum, this is a good question. There's a lot in the world that needs to change. Can you help change the world through film? Hmm. And how might you do that? Well, that's a big, a big uh, question. I, I know for, for me personally, I mean, I'm, I'm as I talked about, I'm trying to say something about my own life. Uh, and I think Pixar is definitely, uh, you know, they want strong stories and we're always looking for entertainment. So I think, with it, so just so that it doesn't come off like we're trying to be too highfalutin here as I talk, what we're trying to do is just make funny movies, right? That entertain people, that move people. 
Um, uh, I will say, this movie uh, that I just finished, Inside Out, I've had a number of people say, especially with autistic kids, it's been really interesting. They've said their kids have used this movie as a tool to talk about their own emotions that previously they had no way of communicating about. That was pretty powerful. Um, that was, yeah. I can't take credit for that because it's just a, a great byproduct of, of uh, the film. Um, but it does kind of point to that maybe in some way you can, you can make small changes uh, in trying to influence people and change people's minds. I remember seeing a film called The Man Who Planted Trees. I don't know if you guys have seen that short film, Frederick Bach, who just passed away recently. A beautiful film about preser preservation and, and nature. I encourage you to check that out if you... If you uh, want to see a great movie. So speaking of Inside Out, what was your daughter's reaction to Inside Out, seeing how her moods inspired it? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't tell her for a long time <laughs> that, that I was making a movie uh, based on watching her. And uh, so finally, at the end, I, I knew I couldn't prolong the inevitable any longer. I brought her and, and my wife to, to Pixar, and they sat through one of the screenings. And afterwards, I kind of went up to her and like, hey, uh, What'd you think? And she's 16 now, because you know it's been a number of years since we started. She was 11 at the beginning, now 16. Uh, and I kind of went up to her and, what'd you think? And she said, hmm, good movie, Dad. <laughs> so <laughs> I thought, all right, I really scored. <laughs> That's high praise for a 16-year-old. So she, she really liked it, actually. Yeah, she's, I'm sort of exaggerating. She, she did later confess to really being moved by it and crying and laughing and so on. So Aww. that's it's really cool. I think I have about two questions left. Since okay. becoming a director, do you ever get the opportunity to do more of the nitty-gritty animation anymore? And if you don't, how do you exercise those skills? Um, on Monsters and, and on Up, I was able to animate the last shot of those films. So I got to do a very small amount. Um, and then I still do flip books just for my own fun. Because uh, I, I kind of don't, tr I, I want to feel like I actually do something. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, and I do, you know, obviously I, I do some writing and things like that as well. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, what's interesting is the work uh, at Pixar is great, but, and it's a collaborative process. Um, so that fulfills a certain, almost like a sense of community in a, in a way. Like you, you feel like, hey, we're in this together. By the end of these movies, and everybody goes on to other movies, there's this sense of, oh no, my family is you know, moving to South America or something, uh, you have this sense of this real sadness because these people have become, become so close. The, the act of creating something uh, together as a group uh, is really uh, pretty amazing. Um, but it is also nice, it's a different kind of an itch to scratch to just make something yourself that nobody else has an editorial voice in. I could just do it and if it's bad, then so be it. But it's mine, you know. Uh, so I try to balance those things. Final question, good way yeah. to end it. Can you talk about the outtakes at the end of your movies? Do you just have fun at that point? <laughs> that was an idea John Lasseter had, even on Toy Story, that uh, the very first film that we did, that maybe we would end it by showing these outtakes. And we, we, we were barely able to finish the movie, much less do any outtakes. But um, we started doing it on Bugs Life. And the, the interesting thing is it's actually a lot of work because <laughs> Um, every, you know, like in live action, those are actual mistakes, right? So if you film actors and they flub the line, then everybody laughs and you can just show that. In our movie, we have to write it, perform that, animate it, and pretend it was a mistake when it was actually all planned out. So that's um, quite a different thing. But it is fun. It's definitely fun. I mean, I, I will say just in closing, I feel like I'm probably the luckiest guy in the world. I have this amazing job that allows me to do what I love um, and I know it's very rare, I totally know this, that, that somebody would say, hey, come here, what movie do you want to make? I, I have that situation. I don't get to totally call all the shots, but I don't want to either because I think it's a necessary thing to have checks and balances. Um, and, and, you know, I work at this company, Pixar and, and, and Disney, that is then able to turn around and show those movies around the world. So I'll go to South America or Russia or whatever, and people will have seen these movies that I made, it's crazy. I am so grateful for that. And uh, I'm grateful for you guys for coming this evening. Well, Pete, you are fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, Pete Doctor. Thank you.